The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazine. There's always controversy over the idea of painting with photos. Should you do it? Should you not do it? The, the reality is that painting with photos can be a really good thing, but you want them to look lifelike. You don't want them to look like photos. You don't want the disadvantages that photos have, which is not showing the light, not showing the color properly. So you want to learn the techniques for painting photos properly. I think you're going to enjoy this segment from Chantel Barber. I'm Chantelle Lynn Barber and I love working in the acrylic medium and not only do I love working in the acrylic medium I love capturing the human spirit in paint and so today I want to share with you my journey in this acrylic medium when I first started off painting in the 90s there were several artists who told me that the only way you could work with acrylic was to either do abstract work or use it to create bold graphic paintings, not portraits. Well, I decided that I was going to break the rules and I was going to come up with my own style, which is very loose and impressionistic and very energetic, and that I was going to paint portraits despite all those naysayers. And so I am going to share with you that this acrylic medium, despite its dry time, is actually very uh, encouraging to artists and it's something that will make you a stronger artist because of the fact that you have to be aware of your values. We're also going to talk about how you can take a photograph and use that as your inspiration to create an emotion-filled portrait painting rather than simply copying a photograph. So we'll be discussing the differences between working from life and working from a photographic reference in order to make it easier for you to pick up this medium and experience the joy of working with it. So now I'm going to share a little bit about the supplies that I use. When working with acrylic, I find that I have chosen these tools because I feel that they're the very best to get the effects that I value. When it comes to acrylic paint, I like to use the acrylic heavy body. I use the heavy body rather than the soft body because of the texture. I want the paint to be extra thick. I want to be able to put it on the palette and be able to mix my colors and have them be as close to the out of the tube consistency as possible. But there are times where when I'm working with the acrylic painting where I want to create a glaze effect or create some interesting splatter effects. And that's when I'm going to work with the acrylic inks. I like the acrylic inks because they have intense pigment. And it's much better to use an acrylic ink rather than water down your heavy body acrylic paints. I also use a variety of mark making tools. I've got uh, catalyst um, blades, which are very effective when you're using either the heavy body acrylic or when you're working with acrylic inks, if you're working with uh, passages of gesso on a canvas. I've also got 
a handy dandy mirror that I use when I'm checking a work of art. And this is, it goes with me everywhere. I would actually panic if I didn't have this tool because it's so effective to be able to see drawing errors and to be able to see your work of art from further back perspective, especially if you're in a very tight area where you're not able to step back from it. One of the things that is so important though when you're dealing with acrylic are going to be your brushes. I have a variety of brushes that I use, but what I have found is that having a bristle, hog's hair bristle brush, is one of the best tools. And that's because it gives you more control over the paint, and it also has, uh, it's a coarser brush. And because acrylic is not as thick as oil paint, I need to have a brush that I feel I can control the paint with. And this gives me the greater amount of control. So the majority of my brushes are going to be hog's hair bristle. I do have some synthetic paint brushes, and those are better when I'm working with a thinner passage of acrylic paint or if I'm using an acrylic ink. Um, I've got the Filberts. Those are my go-to brushes when it comes to painting a portrait. I also use fan brushes sometimes. I'll use uh, dagger brushes at different points in time. And when it comes down to the really small detail work, I, let's see if I can pull, find one here, I will use one of these tiny liners. And this is actually the way I sign my name because I'm one of those artists who, if it were up to me, I wouldn't sign the painting at all because I like all the paint passages so well, but I know I have to sign it. So I, this is my go-to brush for not only signatures, but for uh, if there's a particular detail that needs to be very small in the painting and I need to have precise control over it. I love to create different effects with sandpaper. And this is just fine sandpaper, a sanding sponge. You can get some incredible passages with acrylic simply by taking some of the paint off with one of these sanding sponges. It's not always about how much paint you put on in a painting. Sometimes it's about how you edit that paint and take some of it off. So talking about taking paint off, I found even steel wool can be effective when I want to remove some passages of paint. That ends up being a, a great tool. I've also got a couple of palette knives. Now, when I paint, I very rarely would use a palette knife of this size, the larger one. My go-to palette knife is this smaller palette knife. And the reason I use a smaller palette knife, it's easier for me to control it. I can get some really cool precision marks with this knife rather than a, a big bulky palette knife. I've also got some of the uh, smaller catalyst blades and it's interesting because a catalyst blade, since it's made of silicon, gives you a softer passage than a traditional palette knife would. And because acrylic does dry darker and it's got some hard edges, I'm always looking for tools that I can use to create some softer passages. And also it helps me to have the lost and found edges in my work that I really enjoy being able to add to what I'm doing. Um, trying to see if I've gone over everything. Oh, I have a handy dandy hair dryer. And as if acry acrylic doesn't dry fast enough already, I need it to dry even faster at different times. Uh, one of the very best reasons that I love working in acrylic is how quickly the paint dries. And that allows me to layer and create all these wonderful effects. Sometimes I've got to speed up the process and that's when I grab my hair dryer and it is uh, another tool that is a, a, one of those must-haves. It's always in my supply bag. So I want to talk about what is the difference between working from a reference photo versus life? Because sometimes photographs don't give us all the information that we need and it is true that whenever possible, you do want to work for life. There are some great 
uh, assets from that. You're going to learn about colors. You're going to learn about values. But the reality is that we live in a world where it's not always easy to get a model. And sometimes I find it's easier for me to take a model out and do a photo shoot and then create my painting based on that more as my inspiration than to actually have a model come and sit in the studio. So what I wanna walk through right now is how to take a good reference photo, what are the things you're going to look for, and then what can you do with Photoshop to actually make your photograph stronger when you're working from it. First of all, it's important to know what the human face looks like. We know obviously this is not flat. We have a three-dimensional form. One of the ways I like to remind myself of that is to take either a paintbrush that doesn't have any paint on it, obviously you don't want to do that, or a makeup brush, and if you're actually just running it over the, your features, you're feeling that form underneath your, your brush. And then when you start to look at your reference photo, you can remind yourself of what that form actually felt like so that your brush strokes are going to follow the form. Another thing that I find is very good is to obviously take your own photographs. You are there on the spot. You're going to remember what's happening. You are going to remember the feeling of not only the mood and the emotion that you want to capture, but also the light. How is the light interacting with the model's skin? What colors are you seeing in that light? What kind of values are you visualizing? And if you can't remember this, you can make yourself notes. And then when you go back and you work from your photograph, you're going to have either your actual reference notes or you're going to have those mental notes because you were there on the spot. And that way you can pull as much information from that photograph as possible. Uh, one of the things I'd like to show you are samples of what I like to say are some really good reference photos. So this is one that I feel is an excellent reference photo. It's, it's got good bones for me to work with. I took it myself. I was there on that day. It was a spring day. I remember not only the colors, but the, the type of weather we were having. I remember how the light was hitting her face. I look at this and I have to be able to edit this when it comes time for me to paint from it. I know that I cannot put all of this information into my painting. It's going to be too much. I want to direct the viewer where they need to go. So what I'll do is I'll take this image and I'll go ahead and drop it into my Photoshop app. And then I can use different editing tools to help me decide how do I want to portray this in my painting, what's going to be my composition, and what story am I looking to tell? Because every painting I do has a story. It has that human element, and it has that human story, and that is going to connect with my viewer. One of the things I do is I look at, under the um, filters tab, I can pull up some of these different filters. For example, if I go with the, um, brush strokes, accentuated brush strokes, you're going to see immediately the change that we have here. This gave this photograph a whole different feel. And what's so cool about this is you may not necessarily paint from this particular um, tool here, the way that we've changed it, but it's going to maybe give you as an artist a different view take on this photo. Let's go ahead and take that one off the screen and let's see what happens when we hit the smudge button. So this smudge stick, wow, it really made that background just pop. And it's almost too much. It's almost like a, a, a neon feel. But look at how it puts her in the shadow. And if you want to have a painting that has more of a mysterious feel, you could use this app because her face now has that mystery. You could almost not even put all the details in her eyes, be able to take some of those details out, and you've got this incredible sense of mystery. So I'm gonna go ahead and undo that, and now I'm gonna show you, if we turn, go into our effects tab, 
And one of the tools I like to play with is where it says old vignette. And when I click that, it gives a completely different look. Look at that. That is just incredible. It's very moody. It has, uh, the values are very, I mean, it has uh, overemphasized the values. And obviously it's taken down your color. We've got uh, very little color in this. But again, it's a whole different mood than what we had with the other photograph. When I look at this, it sparks that inspiration of, you know, it would be so cool, even if I didn't even put in the background, to have her with the uh, right eye, you don't even see it. It's there. You know it's there, but it completely goes off into this feeling of mystery. And the left eye, you could put a little bit more detail into it and bring that out. So that is uh, really an effective tool for, I guess the best way for me to say this, instead of my doing thumbnail sketches, a lot of times I'll sit at my computer and I'll play around with these different apps and that becomes my thumbnail sketch. That is going to help me decide what composition I want to do with this. So if I take those apps off and I simply go into my layers tool, let's say that you've decided you don't want to have all these extra effects. You want to take the original photograph and you want to use it the way it is. You can go ahead and pull up. We've got several different choices here. We've got levels and what I can do is go into that levels box and I can make my darks a lot darker so immediately I've brought up the color. I, there's more saturation to it. I can make sure that the lights are going to be lighter so I've brightened the whole image here and that has really helped me so that if I wanted to paint from this particular image, I can now see into those shadow areas. I'm going to be able to see depth. I'm going to be able to see the, the colors. I know that they're not void of color, that they're color filled. I can also use this middle lever here and change how much shadow is, is in the middle value. So if I go over this direction, obviously everything's quite a bit darker. If I feel that I can't see enough information in her face, then I can lighten that. And now I'm able to see not only the values, but I'm able to see the color temperature, my color saturation, and I still have the beautiful light up above at the top of her head. And I've got this gorgeous, um, if you look at the angles that are coming on her, around her head, it, visually the rhythm is just absolutely stunning. So I've got this rhythm that I could capture in a painting. Another thing I can do is decide how I'm going to crop it. We've got lots of different options here. You can see what would happen if I just cropped out and I've completely eliminated the majority of the background and all I really have is the focus of her face. Because the original photograph was taken where I was below her and looking up at her, I could go ahead and crop this in such a way that she is going to be, let me go ahead and move this here. I'm gonna take that up. And if I want to move this down like that, and I can fill in uh, the, the blank space. I can go ahead and, and take a tool. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. Let me take the brush tool and I am going to, actually the eyedropper tool. I'm going to pull up this color, this green here. Oh, you know what? I just realized I, in order to do that, I've got to go back it's going to make me go back to the first to do it from the beginning here. There we go. So if I pull up a color, uh, let's say I take this green and then I'm going to crop this again and pull this down. So she's going to be at the top. We're going to hit that. Now I can go in and take my eyedropper, 
pull the color, grab the brush tool, and if I pull, when I get the brush tool, I've got to go to Tool Options, change the size of my brush, click on here, we're going to minimize that, and I can paint in so that I don't have this big white area that's going to be distracting to me. Another thing I could do is, let's just say that we don't want the background at all. We want to completely eliminate the background. So we can go ahead and once again take this eyedropper tool, grab some of this light color that is in the background, grab our brush, going to go into tool options, make the brush larger. Oh, a little bit too large, so we're going to go back, click this off, and now look, I can completely take out this background, or at least soften it to the point where I can decide, do I like the idea of perhaps just her being in a very neutral, light background? And how is that going to look? Is that going to really bring out more of the emotion and the mood? So I'm going to close out this photo, and I want to show you another photo that I think is very, uh, another really great example of a great photograph that you're going to work from. So this particular one, we were outdoors, and you've got this great composition with the tall hat, you've got her face underneath it, the way her hair is coming down. When you are taking your photos, remember that you want to take a, a photograph where you're going to be able to have that information for later. You do not want a photograph where the person's head is that big. That's going to be a problem. It's not going to give you enough information. So depending on whether you're looking to have a full figure or whether you're looking to just have a head and shoulders, think about that as you're taking the photographs. Also make sure that the light, that you have decent light to start off with. Because if your photograph is too washed out, in the beginning if your lights are too washed out, you can't put that light back into it later on. So what I want to do here is I'm going to go ahead and we're going to go back to the, the Levels tool and uh, click on the Hue Saturation. What happens if I bump up the saturation of everything? And let's move this little gadget over here so we can see. I increase the saturation. Look at that. I mean, I can go totally neon if I wanted to really abstract her out. Or if I want to make this a little bit more believable, I can go and have just that much of the saturation. And you can see how I can also go in here under the master tool and I can either choose to have more reds in this, more yellows, more greens. Um, I can go and up, see if, let's see how many blues are in it actually. That would be very interesting to see. Look at that, it's mainly in her hat. But I may not have realized there was blue in her hat before. By using that tool, I can now see the blue tones that are coming up in her hat, and I can choose to incorporate that into a final painting. And that's one reason why I love being able to do this with the Photoshop. Not only is it going to make my original reference photo stronger, but it's going to spark that uh, inspiration, you know, that feeling of creativity. And I may end up taking this photograph in a completely different direction than what I initially thought I was going to do with it. If I hit the gradient button, this is very interesting because look at what that does. It completely, uh, what I call, washes out the whole photo. And depending on where I put this little angle tool, I could wash it, this out in such a way that it's almost as if the light is coming from up here and you're seeing, you're, if you were looking into the sun, you're not going to see her hat as much. You're not going to see the, the brim of her hat. You're going to see a little bit more of her face. And then as you go down into her hair, into her neck and her clothing, that's where it's going to uh, intensify, not only the details, but the color. This would be really cool if you want to play around with having less information in your painting. So what I want to conclude this section with is talking about editing. That is so important when we edit something.
And one thing that happens whether you're working from life or whether you are working from a photograph, you've got to edit. You cannot put everything in. You're going to have to learn to edit with your eye, but it's very helpful to begin editing using this tool on the computer. And then you get to the point where visually, when you look at something, you immediately know what needs to be edited out in order for that painting to be as strong as possible. So the first thing I'm gonna do is crop this. And I'm gonna say, I don't want any of her dress. I want this to be a headshot. And not only do I want it to be a headshot, I'm gonna pull this out here and out there. I wanna put her to the side in it. Whoops, that means I've gotta pull this part up so that we don't see the dress, because it's not about that. We're gonna go ahead and go with that. Now I've edited out all this other information that I don't need. Another really cool tool is to come in here and use this color fade vertical. Now look at that. I could actually go with a color and have it in the lower half of my painting. And then that would take it a whole different direction if I did that. So what I'm going to do, we're going to click out of that. And the other thing that I, uh, my last uh, tool that I'm going to show you is once again, if we go back and we take this brush tool and we go in with our eyedropper and let's pull out this pale blue and then we go back with our brush tool and I'm going to go into my tool options, change the brush size because I want to show you how we could edit out this background completely and focus right on her. So let's close this out and we're going to go over this. And obviously I could use a smaller tool if I wanted to go even closer. So let, if I take this brush and I make it a little bit smaller, and let's try that out. That would let me get in here into these passages where I want to get closer. Okay, so now it's all about her. It's all about these goggles. It's all about the hair. It's all about the expression on her face. So what we're going to do in today's painting is I'm going to show you how I chose to edit. And not only editing in my photographic reference, but also I'm going to be editing on the canvas and we're going to take it even further. And that's going to make the things that are left in the painting a whole lot stronger. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put the colors out on the palette. All of these colors are heavy body acrylic. So the neutral eight gray goes first. This is a very light gray that's used in my mixing in place of the titanium white. I try to save the titanium white for my brightest highlights. So next, I'm gonna put out the titanium white. Put a nice big gob of that out. And after that, I put cadmium yellow light, and I tend to put all of my colors on the edge of the palette so I can mix into the center of the palette. After the cadmium yellow light comes cadmium orange. Put that next to it. And then I go ahead and I put out alizarin crimson. So you'll notice that some of these paints have are in the tube and some of them are in the jars. And that's simply because the colors that I use a lot of, I find I like to get them in the jars. And I also find an interesting thing about the titanium white, it seems to be a little bit thicker when I get it in a jar versus when I've got it in a tube. So I just put the alizarin crimson out. Now I'm going to go ahead and put out ultramarine blue and these are, again, just basic colors that I'm going to use to get my block in onto my canvas. So this was ultramarine blue. And next to ultramarine blue, I'm going to have red, transparent red iron oxide. This is the only color 
that I'm using that is actually an open acrylic. The reason I use it is it does give me a little bit more flexibility in this drawing stage. However, I don't want it to take too long to dry. So I actually combine it with transparent burnt umber and that cuts the drying time down. I want the acrylics to dry as fast as possible. I'm not looking for them to stay open very long. So I've got transparent burnt umber. And I think for now this is going to work. I, I don't think I'll put any other colors out until I put the block in on the canvas and I see how it looks. If I need to add a few more colors, I have a few colors here that I put in this corner of the palette because they're kind of my extra tones that sometimes I'll add if I feel like the, the painting needs them, if I feel like it's got to have a little extra punch. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up my filbert brush, or actually I'm going to pick up a flat. And I'm using the flat for the initial stage of getting my something up on this canvas and then once I get some uh, color up here, I'll begin pulling the form out. I do this with acrylic for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that I find it's much easier for me to get a form on a canvas right from the get-go. I have a really hard time working with lines. And the reason I have a hard time working with lines in acrylic is because if it dries fast, you can't soften out those edges. I like to keep my initial drawing open and loose. And I like to be able to have it flexible so that I can continue to move things around. I'm already noticing that I'm getting it a little too high. And so what I want to do is immediately bring this down so I've got plenty of space around her head and I'm not going to feel like anything's crowded. I want to, I have a composition in mind and so the composition has got to be incorporated from the very beginning. I don't want to feel like that's an afterthought. I want to know that right from the beginning I've taken that composition and I've considered it as I'm getting this paint on the canvas. So now would be the time to move it around, not wait till the end, but go ahead and take care of that right in the beginning. I'm using a blue shop paper towel. And I use this paper towel because it's so durable. It just allows me to move the paint around. It lets me wipe paint off. Um, I've even painted with a paper towel at times. It, it's fantastic. I can't imagine what I would do without these. So I've gone ahead, I brought this down a little bit. I'm going to squint so that I can see this overall form and start again in blocking in this form. So what I've got on the brush is that transparent red iron oxide with a little bit of the burnt umber. And I'm gonna start to just pull out some of this form and keep this drawing very loose and flexible until I feel good about the placement of everything. So I'm squinting, I'm looking at my angles, try to get those in, keeping in mind what I want this overall composition to be. And I tend to start from the middle, meaning a middle value, and work my way into the darks and the lights. So right now, this would be a good time for me to actually take my mirror. I use this little mirror and it helps me see how this painting is reading. Even though I just have a few strokes on this canvas, I'm still able to, to make a good um, judgment of how it's coming along at this point and if it feels good or if I do need to make some changes right now. So I'm gonna go ahead and look in the mirror and as I'm looking in the mirror, I'm also looking at my reference photo and trying to see what I need to do to adjust it. And one thing I needed to do was bring down that angle there. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring this over a little bit. So I'm gonna check it again. 
I'm always drawing, and I'm trying to draw very accurately. So even though I'm drawing with form, it doesn't mean that I'm not drawing accurately. What I've done, though, is I've trained my eye to see these angles. It's extremely helpful for me to be able to use my eye and visually measure with my eye. Um, I used to use different measuring tools, and it never failed. They always gave me the wrong measurement. So I've decided that I've got to train my eye to see these measurements, and it, it's always accurate. I can get a lot more accuracy if I'm doing that than if I'm using a measuring tool, and it's going to end up taking me down a rabbit hole. So even at this early stage, I'm still beginning to visualize where I'm going. It's almost like a photograph that's out of focus, and I am going to gradually bring it into focus. Another thing I want to do is make sure that I start off with very soft edges. I can always go back in and sharpen an edge. However, if an edge is too sharp, it's going to be very hard for me to soften it up later on. So I start with as many soft edges as I can. Go ahead and we'll change this a little bit. And in just a second, I'm going to work to pull out some of these lights. A little bit more paint. Sometimes I'll tap my paint brush on this white paper towel, or actually it's a, it's a cloth, cotton cloth. The reason I do that is I don't want to get a gob of paint up on my painting. I want to control how much paint I'm putting on. I have a very light touch right now. I'm not wanting this paint to be heavy. It's not a heavy-handed because at this point, I want to be able to lift some of it off, and I want to move it around. The reason I move it around and I keep this drawing flexible, I can't tell you how many years I would work to have an eye or a nose and get it perfectly drawn and find out that it was not in the correct spot. And that was so frustrating. So now, my whole idea is keep it as loose and flexible as possible in these beginning stages, and then I can gradually have this drawing become stronger and stronger as I'm working on it. So for now, I'm going to lay this paintbrush down. I've wrapped it in a blue shop paper towel. The reason I've done that is I don't want the paintbrush to dry with the acrylic paint on it but I'm not going to dip my paintbrush in water. I don't ever dip my paintbrushes in water when I'm using them, unless they're a very soft paintbrush and it's with an acrylic ink, and we'll discuss that a little bit later on. For now, I keep the paintbrushes out of the water, and I wrap them in that shop paper towel because that's going to allow me to make sure that it stays moist, that it is not drying out, and it's also going to make sure that that hog's hair bristle brush doesn't lose its shape. It, has, it remains, keeps that nice shape so that I'm able to control the paint. So I've got to stay vigilant in this stage and really think about what I'm doing here with pulling out the shape of her head. And just start to bring form, develop this form, and then go back. And the whole idea is to keep making it stronger and stronger. And you can see how I'm moving this around, just continuing to get a really good feel for it, squinting. Always want to squint. And then 
I'm going to check it in the mirror again, see how it's reading. The mirror helps me because not only does it show me how it looks further away from a distance, but it's also turning that image around. So let's see. I go ahead, I check this. I see how it's starting to feel, and I can tell what I need to go back in and readjust. So I'm looking at angles, and I'm looking at overall shapes. And a lot of this tends to be putting on, taking off. I'm, I'm putting paint down, I'm taking paint off. Again, I'm moving it around, but notice that as I'm moving it around, I'm getting the sense of a form. It's a three-dimensional form. That helps me tremendously in these early stages to begin to visualize this three-dimensional form coming out rather than feeling like everything is very flat. I want to see these shapes and I want to get this feeling of um, life right from the beginning. It really is about beginning to feel that I've got something human taking place up here. Uh, so I, right now, let's see, I'm going to work on just a little touch with that mouth. I can go back and change that. And I've got to look again at these angles. So I'm going to squint again. And the nice thing about this panel, I can always go back and clean it up some more, change the, the background if I need to. That's why I'm okay if the red shows in this background because it's, it's going to end up working itself into the composition. I'm not really worried about that. I'm going to look again in the mirror, check everything, see how it's reading, decide what I've got to change. So I'm going to work this here. We need to start to show where that eyebrow is going to be. Pick up a little bit more of that burnt umber. And pull the eyebrow, and then what I'll do in just a few minutes, I will start to add limited color to this to continue to strengthen this block in. Now the tricky thing with this particular, the way her head, head is tilted, is going to be the illusion of her looking up and of her head being lifted. As I'm looking at my reference photo, I have to keep in mind that nothing's flat. It's got the form. I also have to keep in mind, how would her head really look if it's tilted up and the planes of the face? So I find that when I paint, I tend to, uh, I guess you could call it, it's kind of a sympathetic response. I tend to put my head in the same pose as the whatever my reference, or sometimes even whatever my model has their head in that same pose. The problem with that is that I end up doing a whole lot of really wonky things with my neck, and then before I know it, I wonder why at the end of the day my neck really hurts, and I realize, huh, it could be all of this, you know, weird head poses that I've got it in, trying to make sure that I'm really capturing uh, the essence of, of my model. And so I'm trying to get better at that because I know that, um, it's not good. <laughs> it's not good for my poor neck. Anyway, I'm continuing to look for adjustments that have to be made, moving things around. I'm going to check. I do a lot of checking in the mirror at this stage because I want to make sure that I've got a really good feel for it. I'm going to fix this, work my way over here. I will even scratch into the paint at this stage. Um, I'm not above using my fingernail. It tends to not be as nice and pretty as it would be if I didn't use it for the painting, but we all have to suffer for art somehow. <laughs> I guess this is one of the ways that, that I pour my whole self into this painting is the, you know, it, it doesn't matter what it takes to get that final, uh, 
vision that I have in my mind's eye. I've got to get to that point. So continue to move things around. We're going to recheck it one more time, see how this, well, actually I'm going to recheck it a lot more than one more time, but I'm going to recheck it one more time now. And then I think it's at a point where I can begin to put some limited color on the uh, surface. I think I've got, I feel pretty good about my overall drawing. And I want to make sure that she's not completely in the center. She's a little bit over to one side, tilted. So let's look at that. Let's look at her, the reference. And I'm going to go ahead and mix up just some very basic combinations that I will be using in this block in. Once again, I wrap that paintbrush up in the Blue Shop paper towel. That keeps it from drying out. The, the paper towel just has a little bit of moisture on it. Not a lot. It's not like it's soaking wet, but it has enough to keep that paintbrush so that I can pick it up in a few minutes and the paint has not dried. It's still going to be very workable. I'm going to be able to continue painting just like I was. So at this point, I'm going to take the N8 Neutral Gray. I'm going to put some of that on the palette with a little bit of the Cad Orange. We're going to mix that up in a pile here because that's going to be pretty much a, a great middle value. Now, I do have, I'm using a Masterson Stay Wet palette. I cannot imagine working with acrylic without a Masterson Stay Wet palette. And this would probably be a good time for me to actually talk about this palette for a, a moment or two. It has the sponge underneath, which has been soaked in water. And then on top of the sponge is the white palette paper. That palette paper absorbs some moisture from that sponge, and that is going to keep the acrylic paint moist and workable throughout the entire painting process. It's also going to allow me to mix not only my different values, my different tints, all of my color pools, and still be able to come back and use those mixtures without them drying on me. That is just something that I have to be able to do when I'm, when I'm painting. I've got to be able to keep my paints so that I can continue painting and not have them become hard or get that film over them. The, I like the fact that the palette has the white paper, and that's because my canvas is white. Now, one of the things that I love about having a white canvas, I can see my values starting to come out. I can see the, the color a lot easier. I can judge color on the white canvas. It also keeps my paint from reading too drab or too muddy in the beginning. I feel like it keeps things very fresh. So I've mixed up this pile and it was the N8 Neutral Gray with some Cadmium Orange. Now I'm going to go ahead and give myself, I'm going to take a, a chunk of the white, pull a little bit of that mixture with the N8 Neutral Gray and the Cadmium Orange into the white so that I have a lighter version of that. Put that there, and I need to mix up a light. I'm going to use the titanium white, pull this over, and pop in just a tiny bit of ultramarine blue with a tiny bit of cad yellow light, and it's going to give me a light that I can throw in there. It's going to be too light, and I know that but I'll be able to use these other two piles to change this to the correct value. Acrylic does dry one value darker on the canvas. I have to keep that in mind. So when I'm doing my mixtures here, I know that they're going to dry a value darker up here. And I am going to mix these a little bit lighter than what I want them to be up on my canvas. So let, I'm going to go ahead now. I'm ready and wipe some of that paint off of my paintbrush. 
I have the, the wet cotton towels that I'm doing that with. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned the size of this brush earlier, so let me go ahead and do that. This is a number 10, and it is a, a flat. And it's just helping me start to carve out some of these planes, and then I'm probably going to transition to one of my filberts. I really do like the filbert. I would have to say it's my workhorse brush for pretty much the entire painting process, and then I add some other brushes in when I want to get different effects. So I've got some light that I'm going to begin to add in. At the same time I'm adding this in, I'm still looking to carve out these planes of the face. I'm squinting, trying to put them in as I see them, as effectively as I see them. And as I'm doing this, so it's almost as if I'm drawing with colored shapes, colored shapes of value. But also, they're going to have some different temperatures, too. Put just a little bit on this bridge of this nose. And that might be a tiny bit too thick. I'm going to take a little bit of that off just so I don't get it too heavy. And now I'm going to grab the little bit darker value, which was that mixture of the neutral eight gray with cat orange. Squint down. I'm using this to shape her forehead. I also try to visualize, when I'm doing this part of the painting, I try to visualize what it would be like if the brush were actually going, running over a person's face in front of me and how I would be feeling that form under my paintbrush. And see, here I go again. I'm lifting the head up, trying to get the feeling of how she would look if she's looking up. And I think we need a little bit of a darker, just a touch of a patch over here. So the block in, I get it to a point where I feel really good about it. I'm not overdoing it. I'm just, I want to begin to feel like I'm going in the right direction. And then I can pull more color into it. But this is really more about getting some of these shadows down and the mid-tone and the light without, without taking it to my darkest dark and my lightest light. So I really want to save those. I'm not going to put that darkest dark on right now and I'm not going to put that lightest light on yet. I do feel that this would be a good time to add one of my friends to the palette. And what I mean by that is I have the colors that are always on my palette. And those were the colors I originally laid out, which were the N8 Neutral Gray, Titanium White, Cad Yellow Light, Cad Orange, Alizarin Crimson, Ultramarine Blue, Red Oxide, and Transparent Burnt Umber. But every once in a while, I feel like I need another color in order to pull together the painting that I'm working on. In this particular painting, or actually I should say in this particular reference photo, there are a lot of what I see as uh, magenta tones. So I am going to go ahead and add permanent red violet to my palette right now, along with viridian hue. And those are going to stay down here in this corner. And I don't know why I do that. I just do. I like to have them down in this corner because they're not always here in the palette. They're, they're kind of the, I guess that's my visiting section. Um, but for the shadow, I feel that it would be really helpful to have, and I'm just doing this with my brush, I'm not even mixing it with a palette knife, to have this combination of the permanent red violet with a little bit of viridian hue. I'm going to put some of that down the palette, and then I'm going to grab some of the neutral egg gray. Now that's way too cold and it's too gray, so a little bit more of the permanent red violet. 
and throw in just a tiny bit of this transparent red oxide to warm it up. And I don't want to get too much paint on the brush, so I wipe some of it off. We're going to, I want to see how that looks as I start to put that up, because I know that's going to dry darker. So I don't want it to get too dark too quickly. And that may be a little, I may want to lift some of that up as I'm looking at it. So let me go ahead and pick up this paper towel. Just put a little bit of water, a little bit of moisture on it. And I'm going to just lift up some of that. Because I do think that was too dark. So because I think it's too dark, I'm going to grab this mixture of the N8 neutral gray with the cad orange in it and see if that helps, if that makes it a little bit better. Yeah, that's, but again, it might be a little too cool. So let's pull some more of that red iron oxide into it and see what I think of that. I think that's going to work. Okay, so I'm wiping some of the paint off my paintbrush, and I'm doing that because I don't want thick paint right now. I want to keep these passages thinner. I want to feel like I can, can move them around. And I like to have contrast between thick and thin passages of paint. And that means that I've got to leave a lot of my, especially my darks, feeling very translucent from the beginning. So pull a little bit more of the, actually I'm going to put on burnt umber with the red oxide and use that to start to want to go back into the shadow and pull that out a little bit more. Okay, let's see. Oh, that's better, okay. Look in the mirror, see how it's looking. Kind of start to put some of that over here, maybe add a little bit more of a blue-gray into that. And that might be a little too dark. We're going to see it. And then if I need to, whoops, if I need to change that, I can do that. It's not too bad on this side. I think it's that side. I want to lift some of it off. So let me go ahead and take that off right now. I'm just barely tapping it just to lift a little bit of that color up. And I need to lay it in more like this. A little bit more of that blue into that mixture. Trying to look at my placement, get that so it's correct. It's still reading a little too dark, but I think it would be okay to just leave that for now. And then I'll come back to that. So I tend to put the eyes and the nose in first. It's, um, this is a, a anchor for me. And if I feel like I can get that correct, the distance between the eyes, the distance between the eyes and the bottom of the nose, then I can always go back to that if I have a problem. Once I get that to where I feel like it's, it's working, then I can measure the distance from the bottom of the nose to the top of the upper lip. And that's going to help me make sure that, that everything, all of my proportions are correct, that nothing's growing, and I don't have too much distance between the, the features. So I, I want to create that anchor right from the beginning and make sure that I've got a good feel and that I've left myself enough space between um, the, the two eyes, between you know, the bottom of the nose to the, the top of the lip. And that's why in the beginning, I find that I, I tend to just make more of a suggestion of where her mouth is until I really feel good about the placement of everything else. So for now, you can see it's just a little bit 
of a mark where that mouth is. And, and that's okay. That placement, I can always tweak this and I can move it around. I'm going to take a second and wrap up this paintbrush because I feel that this is the perfect time to explain a few of the reasons behind why I do what I do. So I'm going to take a moment and talk about why I keep my drawing, my, this block in stage, as open and flexible for as long as possible. I have found that if I continue to move around the canvas and I continue to make fine tune all of the features, I can have a much stronger painting at the end. There were too many years before where I would try to get everything perfectly drawn and then find out that not only was it in the wrong spot, but my painting had lost a sense of life. It had lost the sense of energy and movement, and it had lost a lot of the freshness, mainly because I was having to move things around after I had painted them and got them in the places where I thought they needed to be. If I keep this drawing flexible and I'm able to gradually bring it into focus bit by bit, so it's almost as if it's a photograph that's out of focus, and I'm gradually strengthening it. Every single stroke that I put down on this canvas is making this drawing stronger. So it's going from being very loose and it's gradually getting stronger and stronger. And every stroke is making this drawing more accurate. I'm moving towards getting everything as accurately as I possibly can. So I'm going to continue to do a few more strokes with the um, Let's see, this was the number 10 flat. Then I'm going to grab one of the filberts and finish up the block in stage with using a filbert because uh, I find that that really helps me when I'm wanting to fine tune these forms just a little bit more than they are now. So once again, I'm going to check my reference, look at my painting up here, and I'm actually gonna take a moment to step back and see it from a distance. And as I step back, I can see issues that I wouldn't notice if I was right up on top of the painting. So I step back, I squint, so I'm still looking at my reference, I'm still looking at the overall shapes, but I'm also seeing how this is reading from a distance. And then I'm able to make some decisions so that when I come forward again, I saw that this already feels like it's too low and I need to move it up, begin to move that up right now. I also saw that I need to strengthen this shadow here and that's a little too blue so I'm going to pull some more of the magenta into it and lay that shadow in just a little bit stronger. And down here, lay it in just a little bit stronger. Grab some of the CAD orange with the N8 neutral gray and use that to start to lay in around this eye over here. And then on this side of the nose, I want to have a little bit of a value change, but that was far too dark. That's way too dark. So I'm pulling some of the lighter and I'm going to go back over it and bring that value down, make it lighter. So I begin to have that there. I also think that this would be a good time to put some more color under her eye over on this side. And I want to soften this out. Even though it's still early on in the process, I don't want to have, leave any hard edges. So I'm going to go ahead and soften that right here. And I think this would be a great time for me to adjust her hair just a little bit more on this side. Begin to have some of that width that I need to begin to pull out on this side. That helps 
to put her in the right place. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and move over to the filbert. I'm going to grab a number six and actually this is a number four but it's going to work and pull some of this lighter value onto my brush and work. I need to bring, pop up this a little bit more. Another thing I tend to do when I'm painting, I tend to get more of a caricature in these beginning stages. And that's because I can always go back in and refine it. But I find that if I start off and I don't exaggerate a little bit, I, once again, I lose that sense of emotion. I lose that sense of energy that I, I want so much to pull into this painting, that feeling of life. So because I don't want to lose that, it's important that I have just a bit of a caricature in my uh, initial block-in stage. A little bit notation there, because that's going to be the white of the eye. And bring this forehead up, or not forehead, bring her chin. Go a little bit lighter in value on her chin. And I need to have kind of a stair step between those two. So that, wipe some of that paint off the brush. Grab some more of the N8 Neutral 8 with a little bit of cat orange in it. Okay, so that's helping. I want to grab a little bit more of that and pop it in on the edge of her nose there and going over into that part of her face. And let's get some light. Okay, so here I've got to really look at that angle and see how it's coming down. Because it gives the illusion of her face turning. So let's put that there. Popped a little bit of yellow into the N8 neutral gray. These are all what I like to call just guesstimates of the color that I think I want up there. I use the block in to help me decide what color mixtures I think are going to work on this. And then the, our next section is going to be all about color mixing. And I'm going to actually mix the piles of color that I need to use to continue to build this painting. Initial block in stage is really done with limited color and it's almost as if it's giving me a game plan of which direction to go and I've got some drawing down, I'm going to continue to strengthen that drawing, but I just need to see how not only are uh, the values working, but also an idea of my color temperature, how it's working up on the canvas. One other thing I want to keep bring to your attention is that I have not done a lot of blending. I lay my strokes down almost like a mosaic. Lay the stroke down, lay another stroke on top of it. I'm not at the point where I'm doing a lot of blending right now. And uh, it doesn't need it. And that's OK, because I again, if I blend things away at this stage, I lose them. It's almost as if I had landmarks, and I've wiped all those landmarks down. I want to be very careful to keep this initial block in strong. I don't want to lose the energy. And I don't want to overpaint it. I can overwork this too easily. And then when I move to the next stage, I will have lost a lot of the energy. So having said that, this would be a great time for me to go ahead and once again use this little mirror, look at it in the reverse, look at my um, reference photo, 
and just see if I have enough to where I can kind of leave this block in and then pick it up again and continue to move it into the next stage of the painting. And what I did notice when I looked in the mirror was that this is way too dark a value. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that down because it, it was just not working. Bring it down and check it again. And I'm going to go ahead and bring this. I feel like I want to bring her neck down to this value here. A little bit too much. And then look again. And I think I'm actually getting to a place where I can leave this point and then move on to the next stage, which will be to continue to build the painting with some uh, my color piles of paint. We're going to talk about how I mix the color and how I control the values on the palette and then continue to make this stronger. Now see, what I did there was actually something I didn't want to do. So I'm going to lift up a little bit of that. Put down the original value again. And then bring this part to a close. I think one of the most challenging things for me as an artist, and especially as an artist who works in more of this loose, very energetic, impressionistic style, is not to overwork my block in. I can't tell you how many times I have known I should stop, and I keep thinking, oh, but I just put one more stroke on. I'll make it stronger. I know I'll make it stronger. And I lose the whole thing. And so I've learned it's better to stop sooner rather than lose that energy of this initial block-in stage. And sometimes I wish that there was someone who could just run up behind me and smack me and say, put the paintbrushes down, walk away from the canvas, and then move on to the next stage. So I think that this is probably the time where I'm going to have to say that I'm leaving this block in the way it is. It feels really good. Uh, when I come back to it, I can check measurements, I can check angles, and we can mix up more color that will be applied to it. So now that I'm at the end of the block in, this is what I do to take the fear factor away from me. What do I mean when I say fear factor? When you get a painting to a point where you're very satisfied with it and you feel like that's a strong block in, Sometimes you can get very timid about the strokes that are going to come next, the subsequent strokes. One thing I love about acrylic, or I should say one of the things I love about acrylic, is the fact that because this is going to dry, any subsequent paint strokes that I put on are not going to jeopardize the integrity of this. So for example, I come back, I say, oh, that's a great block and I'm really excited. I'm going to start painting away and oh, no, that, that's in the wrong spot. That, that made her forehead look like it was going back instead of you know, coming forward where it needed to. All I have to do is take a paper towel with just a little bit, tiniest bit of water on it, lift up that stroke that was not reading right, and it has not bothered the integrity of what's underneath it. So when I'm at home in the studio, what I do is I allow this to dry anywhere from 20 minutes to overnight. If I am doing a demo, or even like I'm doing here in the studio where I need to move this along, I go ahead and I have a handy dandy hair dryer that I use to dry this. And by drying it with the hair dryer, I make sure that this is going to be completely dry. And when I put more strokes of paint on, they're not going to lift up these strokes so that I maintain the integrity of my block in, and that removes that fear factor for me. And it keeps me from being a timid painter. It allows me to throw paint down and not worry about it. So now I'm going to go ahead and dry this with a hairdryer, and then we're going to move into our next section. 
Now that the hair dryer part is over and my painting is completely dry and this is going to allow me to put subsequent paint strokes on without hurting the integrity of my initial block-in. There's a couple of points I want to make before we move on to our next chapter. When I do a block-in, I do it a little bit differently than um, you might think of as a, a traditional block-in. I keep it very expression filled, for lack of a, a better word. I want there to be a certain likeness to my model and that's simply because I do, I, I've used this model because of the ability they had to get that expression that I was looking for. But I also want to maintain artistic license. And my work is all about getting that emotion, that human connection and having my viewer see this painting and have that human connection. And what I've learned over the years is that if my initial block-in has a very strong uh, emotion-filled feeling right from the start, then I know this painting is moving in the right direction. In order to get that strong emotion, there are times where I have to over-exaggerate things. So if you look at what I've already done with this block-in, there are areas that have been over-exaggerated. Uh, sometimes even the values. I'll over-exaggerate them a little bit simply so that I know where they are. I can always come in and I can adjust these values. I can make sure that uh, I'm getting them correct, that I'm getting uh, very soft transitions between my values, that I'm avoiding hard edges. But I've got some great bones here and I don't want to lose those when I come in and I start making subtle adjustments. So if I start off with more of a caricature, things being more exaggerated, then when I come back in and I start fine tuning the draw, or the, well, drawing, because even though I'm painting, I'm still drawing. When I start fine tuning that, I won't lose the energy that I had in the beginning of my block-in. So I don't have any hard lines in this block-in. The reason being is that acrylic, when it dries, it's hard to have translucency in my shadow passages if I have these lines showing through. I don't want to have a lot of hard edges that I can't soften up. So I've avoided having any lines. I've pulled the form out. It's all about trying to get away from this feeling of flat. Acrylic tends to have a flat look in the beginning. I want to stay away from that. So I have pulled dimension out. I've already pulled form out. I'm already getting the feeling of the, the uh, going around her nose. Her nose feels like it's coming out of her canvas. I feel the uh, weight of the cheekbones here. I'm starting to see that come out. I've given myself a little bit of extra playroom with her chin and her forehead so that I can come in and continue to refine these shapes and I can get my drawing spot on. Remember, I'm keeping this open and flexible. I'm going to continue to refine this drawing, continue to move it to a point where I am satisfied with everything and I feel like it's working for the whole of the painting. I'm also aware of my composition at this stage and that's why I've left a lot of edges out here that as I continue to develop the painting, I'm going to be able to come back in and deal with these edges. Now I should mention at this point that when I am working from a reference photo instead of from a live model, I like to have that reference photo on my computer screen. I think the reason I like it on the computer screen is because there's a light behind it on the computer screen. And for me, it makes it feel more life-filled. I, I feel like it's more like the person than if it was a printed photograph. So I do always work from a reference photo on my laptop or on my computer at home, whatever, wherever I am painting. And that allows me to get, uh, once again, that feeling of life, that feeling of strong emotion from the very beginning. Because I really want to put that expression, the expression that I'm going for, as number one. So what we're going to do now, now that we've talked about the block-in and a, a few of the, the reasons behind why I do what I do, we can move forward and continue to develop this painting. So before we move on, 
we need to talk about color mixing because I just briefly touched on color mixing when I put the block in. I am going to put out my colors and I'm going to try to keep it as close to the, the order that I use when I lay out my palette in the studio. I'm going to start with the N8 neutral gray. I've got a pile of that. And then I'm going to put out my titanium white. Now, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but it's worth mentioning again. I find that the titanium white seems to have far more body in the jar than it does in the tube. So I tend to favor it. I'm not sure if that's really true or if I'm imagining it, but it doesn't matter because the point is I, I feel that way when I'm working with it. And if I buy the big jar, I end up having enough white paint and I don't run out at a time when I really need it. So it works both ways. The next color is going to be uh, Cad Yellow Light. And then after Cad Yellow Light, I'm going to go with Cadmium Orange. Put that next to it. I tend to lay them out along the edge of the palette so that I can move my mixing into the middle of the palette. So after Cad Orange, I have got a Lizarin Crimson Hue and we're going to put a pile of that here. And then after alizarin, I'm going to put out ultramarine blue. It's going to go here. And then I have the transparent red iron oxide. a little bit there. I'm probably going to need more of that because that one is, I would mentioned earlier, it's one of the open acrylics. And so it tends to get a little bit more watery, faster than I'd like it to get. So I tend to put out fresh paint often with that color. The next one is going to be the transparent burnt umber. Now over in this corner, this, so this palette right here are the colors that I use all the time, no matter what I'm doing. Every so often, I feel like a particular uh, painting is going to need to have my extra friends or visitor paints, and those are the ones that get put in this corner because they're not always on my palette. And so in this corner, I'm going to put my permanent red violet. I have to look at the name because sometimes I get it confused and I don't say it quite right. And then I'm going to put down Viridian Hue permanent. And they're just going to stay over there, and I'm only going to use those as need be. Before I start mixing these colors, I'd like to touch on this palette again. I cannot imagine painting an acrylic without having a Stay Wet palette. So the Stay Wet palette is consisted of this sponge, which has got water in it, and then the paper, which has been soaked. And that sponge is going to allow the paper to pull that moisture and keep these paints so that they're workable. It also is going to allow me to be mixing different color piles of paint and be able to keep those throughout my working session and not have them, them dry on me. So I'm going to be able to bend these colors. I'm going to be able to do, do whatever I need to do with my paint and feel that it, it hasn't dried out, it hasn't got a film over it. It's almost as if I was working with a medium such as oil. The other thing I like to do when I'm working in acrylic is have my paints as close to the out of the tube consistency as possible. I don't want what I call wimpy paints. I don't want wimpy paints. I want paints that have some body to them. That's why I use the heavy body paints. So these, if I find as I start to paint, that these are getting wishy-washy, I'm going to scrape it off and I'm going to put out new paint so that it's got that texture that I need. Painting in acrylic requires that you stay tuned in to the values. You've got to really be aware of the values that you're, the, the color pool that you're mixing. You need to be aware of those values. Acrylic does dry one value darker on the canvas. Now the reason it does that is because the, the polymer in acrylic, when it's in the tube, it's actually opaque and white. When it dries, it dries clear, which is why it's going to value darker. I have found that having to have a sensitivity 
to the values of my paints has actually made me a much stronger artist. It has been one of the best things that I've uh, been able to learn and to use in when I'm creating my paintings. I also have found that uh, it doesn't intimidate me to come back to a canvas that's now dry and be able to get a similar value to what's already up there because I know what these colors are going to do to one another and I also know how to create the value that I need. When I start off with this beginning block in and, and start building this painting, I'm guesstimating what colors I need to mix. I'm looking at my reference and I'm going to make decisions not only based on the value of the color I need, but also on how much chroma it needs to have, how much color, the intensity, uh, whether or not it needs to have a warm undertone, whether or not it needs to have a cool undertone. I, I have to guess on those things. I'm going to mix it on the palette and then once I start putting them up on this canvas, I will be able to decide if they need to change. And at that time, I can do what I call bending these color pools. So to start off, I'm going to have some of this neutral N8 gray. And this gray, I mentioned before, but we'll mention it again, is used to mix some colors when I want to save the white for the lightest lights. And so I'll go ahead and mix a pile of this. If you look at my block in, you'll see that I've tried to stay with the middle values as much as possible. The only dark that's up on the block in right now is her, the dark in her eyes. I'm also going to mix with the N8 neutral gray. I may need to squirt some more out there. A combination of the gray with cadmium yellow light. And that makes a really great kind of a greeny yellow tone that can be used in some of the shadow passages. For one of the light areas, I can pull a mixture of titanium white with a little bit of cad yellow light and a little bit of cad orange. Go ahead and get that mixed up. And then I also, right next to that, I can have another pile which is going to be the titanium white with, let's put a little bit of the blue in that because I do see some blue tones in um, the light passages. So I'm gonna mix that up first, see how that reads. And then I can always go back and forth between these two piles. I also want to have a pile of light that's going to be a, a little bit warmer. So I'm gonna pop in the cad orange, and I'm going to pop in the alizarin crimson. And as you can see, that's just a nice pinky tone that has more of that orange undertone to it. As far as getting some of the shadows, I like to take this permanent red violet with a little bit of the viridian hue and pull some of the N8 neutral gray into that. And we're getting kind of this violety color, which actually, is, that's a little, it's, it's two violets. So I'm going to pop some of this green into there, tone that down a little bit, a little bit more. And then I can take the red oxide, throw some of that into this mixture so that it warms it up even more. What I found with color mixing is that you could give me formulas all day long and they didn't make sense to me. I had to actually go through and mix these colors on the palette to see what each color does to one another. And once I knew what those colors did to each other and I kind of internalized that, then I knew which colors I needed to grab in order to get the desired effect up on my canvas. So I find that if I need light, I'm gonna probably be pulling either the neutral eight gray or the titanium white as my base. Then I'm going to either pop in some of the cad yellow or the cad orange, or like I did with the darker tones, I can even use those to create lights. I'm just gonna have a little bit less of that color because I know that these are gonna take over the whole pile. I think that that's one reason why I use a small palette knife. 
it helps to remind me that sometimes the tiniest bit of color is all I need to bend a whole color pool. I don't need a lot. And when I'm mixing, having this smaller palette knife reminds me of that, and it keeps me on track. It helps me from really losing the, the colors that I'm looking for. And if you can throw a lizard and crimson in one of these piles, and if you put too much, you've lost the whole pile, the integrity of the pile. It, it just kind of takes over. So I'm going and put out more white because I know I'm going to be needing this. And I, th I think what I'd like to do is have a really nice gray because I see a lot of beautiful grays in her face. And they tend to have... The interesting thing about this particular reference photo that I'm going to be using as my inspiration is that even though her shadow has cool notes in it, it also has warmth overall. Um, my model has very fair skin. If I make the shadows on her face too cold, it will make the fairness of her face, the area in the light and uh, midtones, look very pasty and washed out. I want to avoid that. So it's going to be better for me to end up warming my shadows. And even if I overwarm them, it's okay. I can always bring another cool note back in, as opposed to getting too much cold blue tones in her face and then having her look like she's been in some kind of, you know, beat em up fight and, and she's got bruises all over her face. Uh, so I, I do want to have some of these gray notes, but I've got to make sure that they're tempered. I'm going to take the ultramarine blue and a little bit of this transparent burnt umber and pop in some of the neutral eight gray to lighten that. And that's going to give me a nice pile of grays that are starting off as a darker value, but that I'm going to be able to bend and change uh, to whatever I need it to be up here on the canvas. So once I have piles of paint like this on my palette, then I can start pulling these different colors into one another to bend a color. So for example, I start to paint with this and I find out it is too pink, it's too dark. So I know I've either got to put the N8 neutral gray into it to lighten it, or titanium white to lighten it. And if I want to cut down that pinkness, I could go and pop a little bit of the yellow into it. I could put a little bit more of the orange into it. If it was too orange or too yellow, then I can go ahead and take a little bit more of the blue and put it back into that mixture. Anytime you put white in a mixture to lighten it though, it may, it's going to take down that color. And you may end up with a light that, again, is way too pasty. So sometimes when I lighten a color, I touch just the tiniest bit of chroma back into that mixture so that I've brought down the value, but I'm bringing a little bit more of the intense color back into it. Um, another mixture that I'd like to have here, just in case I need it for the lights, is just simply some of the titanium white with a little touch of the cad orange, and that makes such a pretty warm pink tone. When I am painting a person, I don't, the, the term flesh tone never enters my mind. I can take the same palette and paint anybody. It doesn't matter whether you have dark skin tone, whether you have light skin tone, whether you have more red in your skin, more yellow, and in a way, um, this is what I love. I, I love being an artist because it gives me these great ideas about life. I'm, I'm one of those deep thinkers. I'm always thinking about things. And it makes me feel like, as the human race, we have a lot more in common than differences because this palette can be used to create anybody. It just, what you want to do is instead of thinking of a flesh tone, you want to be thinking about hues, values, and when I look at a, a face, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm painting a cool passage here, I'm painting a warm passage there, does it need to go darker, does it need to go lighter, uh, do I need to have uh, more yellow, more blue, more red in the mixture? 
that's how I'm deciding how, uh, what colors I'm going to mix. There's never the term flesh tone at all. It just doesn't even cross my mind because we are all color filled. Every, everything in our face is beautiful color depending on what light we're in, what shadow we're in, what time of day, and so forth. So anyway, I think we have enough piles here to begin to start the process. And I'm looking forward now to moving on to the next phase of the painting. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. So in this video, I'm going to take you through the block-in stage, which is a really fun stage to do because you're keeping your drawing open, loose, and flexible. And then we're going to move into how we do color mixing and how we work with values and adding details. And all of those things, one after another, allow you to create a very emotion-filled painting. What's unique about my workshop is that I'm an acrylic artist living in an oil painter's world. So I have tips that work not only to add more depth, dimension, and impressionistic feel to an acrylic artist painting, but I can also relate to oil painters because I know all about the value, I know about the different brush strokes, mark making techniques, and so it gives me a unique advantage. I continue to improve my art because I have this goal that every painting has to be better than the painting before. I used to beat myself up over a painting that maybe didn't measure up to the, the quality that I wanted it to be, but now I'm able to accept that painting for what it is, and I can encourage myself by saying, you know what, the next one, I'm gonna push it a little bit further. I'm gonna work on that technique that maybe I felt wasn't quite where I wanted it to be, and I'm going to strengthen it. And so I always want to see my work with a critical eye, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean seeing it for what it is and ways that it can be improved. But on the other hand, I want to be gentle with myself and I want to be encouraging because I know that whether it's my own self-talk or whether it's other artists, that's the best way we can live out our full potential as creatives. Well, that was Chantel Barber, painting from photos, expressive and emotional, and they certainly are. And you can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get right to the interview with Chantel. I started painting when I was about 11 years old. We are very fortunate that a next door neighbor was an artist, and she was willing to take me under her wing, and she taught me to paint. I would go over there one afternoon a week, and I learned to paint still lifes. I did landscapes, but the thing that I was most passionate about, even at that young an age, was people. And so I was thrilled when she finally thought I was ready for the challenge of painting people. And I learned so much about the uh, thrill of painting, even as a young person, because she also was very passionate about what she did as an artist. I started painting in acrylic. It's kind of a funny story. We were going into the Navy. I say we because I found out I was actually part of the military also. And the movers said they wouldn't move the oil paints. They said they were flammable. So we packed them in our car, drove across the country, and we were very naive, very tired. We left all of our stuff out in the car. The car got broke into and all of the oil paints were stolen. So I was looking at the possibility of another 20 years of all of this traveling and I didn't want to fight with movers to take oil paints. I had a fellow artist say, 
did you know about acrylic? You should look into acrylic, it's water soluble. And that was the first time I had heard of the acrylic medium. And I bought myself a set of paints and never looked back. I feel that when I first started in painting in acrylic, which was back in 1990, the world saw acrylic more as something to be used for modern art, to create bold graphic art, and also for beginners to work in and then transition into oil. Fortunately, I've seen through the years that the acceptance of acrylic as fine art and also in the world of portraiture has changed. And now I'm excited to be a part of being able to change people's ideas on this incredible medium and realize that you can create the same quality that someone working in a different medium would be creating. It is fine art and we are able to work in a medium that I believe offers even more versatility than oil can offer us and will also withhold or withstand the test of time. I believe that people should try acrylic because whether or not you decide to work in acrylic, it is going to make you a stronger artist. It is going to make you figure out how to get your values spot on so that when a passage is dry, you're not intimidated about mixing up that same exact color, that same value, applying it to that spot. You're not going to rely on blending. Sometimes, whether you're working in oil or you're working in acrylic, overblending is a problem. And that's what takes the strength out of creating a painting. When you're working in acrylic, you have to learn how to create soft passages without blending because your paint is already dry. So there's no doubt in my mind that when you work in acrylic, it makes you aware of things that all artists need to be aware of and that are going to strengthen their art creating skills. I find my ideal subjects because everywhere I go, I'm studying people. Uh, I have two sons who have told me that that's really weird and I should be careful, but I can't help myself. I see people and I get to know them. And then when I feel the time is right, if it's someone who I really want to paint, I'll approach them and I'll ask them how they would feel about coming and either letting me paint them from life, paint their portrait, or take a photo shoot of them. There's also the common knowledge that in my family, everyone has to be willing to be a model. So it doesn't matter whether you are born into the family, whether you marry into the family, whether you're even with the family for a short period of time, you better be ready for me to approach you to be my model. Because I, once I get to know uh, family members, once I get to know friends, and I see not only their outer beauty, but their inner beauty, I get really excited to capture that on canvas because I know that that human connection, that human spirit is going to speak to us all. We have so much in common. Portrait painting has actually made me a better person. Now I know that sounds really odd, but you cannot stare at faces all day, every day, and not learn to love people. And you learn to love people regardless of whether they're this, the world standard of beauty, the you know, uh, New York standard model, model standard, you see the beauty that comes out when you are taking someone and painting their portrait in paint, which is actually adding a little more glamor to who they are, but it has given me a, a great love for not only the different emotions that we go through as people, but also our, um, just our, our personalities, the different personalities that come through when I'm working with uh, different subjects and I'm creating these portraits. And I just think all the way around, it's made me look at people with a lot more compassion, with a lot more understanding, and with a lot more love. I think what makes me different and one of my strengths is that I never give up. And if you look back over my history, there were a lot of reasons to give up. I was raised in an environment of fear. Uh, I was not encouraged in my art like some artists are. I didn't have the network of other artists in the family who were able to encourage me to keep going, who were even able to maybe give me 
uh, their experiences so I would know how to approach this, this whole art journey. And I had to navigate that pretty much on my own. And not only did I have to do that, but I was an um, extreme introvert. So to send me out and have to learn to be confident in what I'm doing, learn to interact with other people, learn to value my own art and respect it, which is what makes other people respect it, those were really tough learning decisions for me. I had to kind of rethink um, what I had been taught while uh, not only growing up, but as a young person. But the uh, thing that's so exciting is that I was able to move beyond that. And I was able to come away with a sensitivity to artists who struggle with feeling whether or not their work is good enough. They struggle with fear. They can't uh, put a brushstroke up on the canvas because they're afraid is it going to ruin what they just did? Are they going to be a good enough artist? They have all of, they put themselves in their own prison. And I'm able to connect with people who struggle with that. I'm also able to connect with people who are very self-assured in what they're doing with their painting. And I know I would not have that strength as an artist if it weren't for all those things that happened to me early on. I continue to improve my art because I have this goal that every painting has to be better than the painting before. I used to beat myself up over a painting that maybe didn't measure up to the, the quality that I wanted it to be. But now I'm able to accept that painting for what it is. And I can encourage myself by saying, you know what, the next one, I'm gonna push it a little bit further. I'm gonna work on that technique that maybe I felt wasn't quite where I wanted it to be and I'm gonna strengthen it. And so I always wanna see my work with a critical eye, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean seeing it for what it is and ways that it can be improved. But on the other hand, I wanna be gentle with myself and I wanna be encouraging because I know that whether it's my own self-talk or whether it's other artists, that's the best way we can be, we can live out our full potential as creatives. I find the joy in painting and I hold on to it based on some earlier experiences I had. I got to the point where creating a painting was almost like crawling through broken glass. And I realized there are enough problems in life without me taking something that I love so passionately and adding it to that pile of a stress factor and something that is now without joy. So what I had to do was first of all, kind of take a deep breath, be willing to relax, loosen up. I actually became a looser painter because of that, because I knew that I was overstressing on parts of the painting that no one would ever know that I had spent five hours on. So I began to loosen up. I began to enjoy not only mixing the paint, but applying the brush strokes. Enjoy the process. It wasn't just about the finished painting anymore, because that's only a small part of it. It was about that process of creating the painting and realizing if there's a mistake, it's okay. No one has to see it. I can destroy the canvas, I can wipe it down, I can start again. It was a lesson learned, it wasn't a waste of time. And so I was able to come to a place where I could let go of all those things that were holding me back in this joyous experience and just embrace this wonderful blessing that I've been given to be able to create.
Well, that was Chantel Barber, painting from photos, expressive and emotional. And you can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes. Thanks for watching and keep pushing yourself. So in this video, I'm going to take you through the block end stage, which is a really fun stage to do because you're keeping your drawing open, loose and flexible. And then we're going to move into how we do color mixing and how we work with values and adding details. And all of those things, one after another, allow you to create a very emotion filled painting. What's unique about my workshop is that I'm an acrylic artist living in an oil painter's world. So I have tips that work not only to add more depth, dimension, and impressionistic feel to an acrylic artist painting, but I can also relate to oil painters because I know all about the value. I know about the different brush strokes, mark making techniques, and so it gives me a unique advantage. I continue to improve my art because I have this goal that every painting has to be better than the painting before. I used to beat myself up over a painting that maybe didn't measure up to the, the quality that I wanted it to be. But now, I'm able to accept that painting for what it is, and I can encourage myself by saying, you know what, the next one, I'm gonna push it a little bit further. I'm gonna work on that technique that maybe I felt wasn't quite where I wanted it to be, and I'm gonna strengthen it. And so I always want to see my work with a critical eye, and I don't mean that negatively. I mean seeing it for what it is and ways that it can be improved. But on the other hand, I want to be gentle with myself and I want to be encouraging because I know that whether it's my own self-talk or whether it's other artists, that's the best way we can live out our full potential as creatives.